Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much indeed for that uh, marvellous uh, introduction. Uh, President Lyndon Johnson, in comparable circumstances, uh, once commented that was the sort of introduction which my father would have enjoyed and my mother would have believed. Uh, so I, I, I'm, well, I'm grateful for it. Uh, we, you have a very considerable number of uh, items still to discuss, so you'll be relieved to know that I do not intend to make a lengthy oration. Uh, rather, I will follow the wise precedent of King Henry VIII, uh, who apparently said to each of his six wives, please don't worry, I don't intend to keep you long. <laughs> Uh, I am speaking to you, of course, not as a member of the government uh, or, uh, or as a minister in any form or fashion. Uh, I am uh, a private citizen, which gives me a great deal of freedom. Uh, it was once said in Britain, you know when you have uh, left the government, it's when you climb into the back of your car and it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> it's something that happens uh, to us all from time to time. Uh, I speak this morning, obviously, on Brexit and on the European issues. And I speak as someone who was actually Margaret Thatcher's Europe minister, that one of the things you didn't mention uh, when I was a Minister of State in the 1980s, as well as having been uh, Foreign Secretary. But you want to know where I come from uh, in the sense of the Europe uh, debate. Uh, I, I voted for Remain in the referendum and was very disappointed uh, with the uh, outcome. But I voted for Remain nevertheless as a Eurosceptic. Uh, when I was Foreign Secretary, I was described in the French paper Le Monde as a Eurosceptic modéré. Uh, and I think in that uh, sense, my views were not that different from quite a large chunk uh, of the electorate. I'm going to deal essentially with the political dimension this morning. Of course, that's only part of, of the wider issues that we're all grappling uh, with. But I think the starting point has to be to just remind ourselves that what happened on June the 23rd was actually not something extraordinary and out of the blue. It was an accident waiting to happen. Because our whole relationship with the European Union uh, has been semi-detached, dysfunctional, uh, ever since we first joined. Indeed, even before then. When the original com common market was created by the six, uh, they wanted us to join, we declined to do so. When eventually, under uh, Harold Macmillan, we did apply, uh, then uh, General de Gaulle, very presciently and wisely, as it turns out, uh, said, vetoed us and said we were not truly European. From the moment we did join, uh, we were more concerned with what we didn't want to integrate than what we did. Uh, Margaret Thatcher wanted our money back and got it. Uh, and then when the single currency came forward, uh, then we just did not join, under, not just under Conservative government, but under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown's government as well. Likewise, Schengen uh, and other issues of that kind. It's not just Britain. Sweden, Denmark, one or two other countries have had a comparable situation. But for a country the size of the United Kingdom, that was a very profound uh, phenomenon. Uh, I think the other point worth making is to reflect on the fact that, and I suspect I'm right in this, that on June the 23rd, it wasn't just those who voted no who were Eurosceptic or who thought of themselves in those terms, probably the vast majority of people who voted yes to remain were actually Eurosceptic as well, rather like myself. The judgment we made was, well, we're not keen, we certainly don't want to join the single currency, we don't believe in Schengen, we don't believe in the United States of Europe, we rather resent all the bu unnecessary bureaucracy, but on balance we still think Britain benefits more than it would lose, than it would gain uh, from leaving the European Union. This is important in terms of where we go from here, because if I'm correct, that probably Probably most of you who voted Remain, if you did vote Remain, uh, probably think of yourselves as pretty Eurosceptic, unlikely to wish to join the Euro uh, and other new forms of integration, unless there is an obvious benefit to the United Kingdom's standard of living, quality of life, or security. So, so where are we now? Uh, famous lines, uh, if you can treat with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. It's never as good as you hope, it's never as bad as you fear. And for a country the size of the United Kingdom, I have not the slightest doubt, nor have I ever had any doubt, uh, that the United Kingdom could survive as an uh, independent state outside the European Union, I still believe we will lose more than we will gain, and that's primarily uh, in the services and financial uh, sphere. I think the referendum was inevitable. 
Not necessarily the timing of it, but I think that such was the dysfunctionality of our relationship with the EU that at some stage the electorate had to be asked, and indeed even the Liberal Democrats, the most pro-European party of all, came to this conclusion as well, that the, the, the public had to be asked, do you really want us to continue in this organization uh, or to leave it? The timing was unfortunate because of the uh, Middle East migrant crisis, uh, and I don't think the, the way that the pro-Remain side ran the campaign was as clever as it could have been. Uh, because I think that uh, while on the no side there was very little independent or dare I say it expert uh, advice that supported exit and therefore there was inevitable exaggeration on that side. I think the Remain side didn't need to exaggerate. Uh, the hard evidence from non-political independent analysts and economists and businessmen was all relatively one-sided. Not entirely but mainly. Uh, but I think warning that each family would lose on average uh, 4,000 pounds a, a year, mortgage rates might go up to 9%, and particularly the Chancellor, then Chancellor, and Dallas to Darling jointly saying there would need to be an emergency budget within seven days if we voted to leave, and we're still waiting for that budget, which of course, certainly in the short term, isn't going to happen. Now, where we go from here, we're told by many commentators, is a choice between hard Brexit and soft Brexit, and which is it that we want. I want to suggest to you that that's a pretty bogus choice in the way that it is being presented. Once the issue of our membership of the EU was decided, then it seems to me that regardless of how you voted in that referendum, the objective is for the United Kingdom, ought to be, must be in any rational world, must be for the United Kingdom to continue to have as much unrestricted access to European markets as is compatible with our departure from the EU and can be negotiated with the remaining members. So <clears throat> that, asks, that requires us to ask what is it that the electorate voted for? And of course you cannot give a scientific answer to that. But I'm going to suggest that there are three irreducible minimums, as it were, things that cannot involve uh, ignoring in the negotiations to come. Three, not one. Brexit means Brexit, but that's not good enough. I think it means three things. First of all, that we are going to end up not as a member of the European Union. Secondly, there has to be some significant resumption of control uh, over migration from other parts of the European Union, the free movement of labor issue. And I think thirdly, that we can no longer uh, accept the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice and laws imposed on this country, which the UK government and parliament have not chosen to endorse. Now, some may say there are others as well, but that's what I, my own judgment. Everything else is for negotiation. And it seems to me that whether you are a David Davis or a Liam Fox on the one hand, or a Kenneth Clark or a Paddy Ashdown on the other, if it is accepted that we're going to leave the EU, then of course a soft exit, if I have to make a choice, is what we hope to be able to negotiate. The question then becomes, is it realistic? What is possible? What are the options that are going to be before us? I think so far as the Prime Minister is concerned, Theresa May, I know her reasonably well. I worked with her when I chaired the Intelligence Committee and as Home Secretary, she was in charge of MI5. She's tough, she's very hardworking, she's very methodical, she's very focused. I have discovered, like the rest of us, that she's ruthless as well. <laughs> On European issues, I think she was always close to the Brexit position. The reason she didn't join it was I think she was persuaded in her own mind, and I think correctly so, that on intelligence sharing issues, on counter-terrorism issues, we have to have close cooperation with the European Union, and that would be better served by us staying in the EU. And I think for her as Home Secretary, that carried the day. But I would describe her as a skeptical pragmatist, and I think she is looking for some solution broadly using the framework that I have mentioned. Now, we have been told we will not get 
a willing response from our EU uh, current partners uh, because not, some might want to punish us for our decision to leave, but others are more worried and nervous that if we get too easy a deal, uh, then that might encourage others. And uh, that's a legitimate concern at this moment in time. And if I, I'm rather relieved that Article 50 is not going to be invoked until early next year, probably, and the serious negotiations will probably not begin until next spring. Because as each week goes by, the desire to punish for its own sake is slowly receding. The temperature is coming down. And the question of whether other countries might be tempted to have their own referendums and consider Brexit, and the big question is France with Marine Le Pen, who is arguing that that's what indeed should happen. Uh, that will be resolved in the French presidential elections early next year. If she was to win, I don't think she will, but if she was to win, that obviously is a total new departure, much more serious even than the British departure. Uh, if she does not win, then France and the other countries uh, will be much more relaxed because most European countries, particularly, for example, in Central and Eastern Europe, although they may resent the bureaucracy as we do, they may resent some of the supranationalism as we do, from from their perspective, their security, because of their proximity to Russia, because of their history over the last 50 years, if they are the ex-communist countries, they see membership of the EU alongside membership of NATO as fundamental to their liberty. And whatever the Hungarians or Poles or Czechs might say in terms of skeptical uh, views, departing from the EU is not even considered as a serious option. So I think that dimension uh, will gradually resolve itself, and that will be satisfactory from our point of of view. Let me go straight in the limited time available to the single most important issue, particularly perhaps for this audience, which is our continued access to the single market. Now, it's absurd simply to say, yes, of course, we'll have access to the single market. Everyone has access to it. Of course, that's true. China, America, Russia, subject to the tariffs and controls. So the issue is not some question of access. It's a question of tariff-free access uh, and uh, for goods and services, as we know. I think the most appropriate way to look at the single market is to remind ourselves that it actually has four pillars. And if you disaggregate the single market, it becomes easier to see the way forward. The four pillars are free movement in trade, in uh, capital, in labor, and in services. As so far as trade is concerned, that is going to be relatively, I stress, relatively straightforward. EU has many bilateral agreements of free trade with many countries around the world. I don't know what the detail is going to be. That's going to be a hard pound, a hard negotiation. It will take some time. But I've not the slightest doubt that an acceptable free trade agreement will be reached. Uh, of the various options that have been mentioned of whether we go for the EEA or uh, EFTA or something of that kind, uh, I don't think that is a serious option. Uh, the EEA option requires you to incorporate into your own law virtually all the regulations and directives that you will not yourself have been part of the decision-making process. So a referendum that was about bringing back control it can hardly go in the direction of losing the control we currently have without replacing it with something superior. So free trade, we'll negotiate something. Free movement of capital is not a problem for the UK, as we all know. We have free movement of capital. It's never been a controversy in this country for many years. We have no exchange controls. Capital can go wherever it wishes, not just for the EU, but more widely. There's nothing to negotiate on that front. On free movement of labor, yes, there has to be change there from the UK point of view. We will insist on that, and that will limit our other options. But there, the question still arises as to where the compromises might be negotiated. Because already the, the government have said, of course, they would welcome and continue to welcome people with special skills, people from various financial or industrial sectors. Uh, and so the question is going to be where you draw that line. The timing of this is actually unfortunate. Over the next 10 years, in my judgment, <coughs> the EU is actually going to have to renegotiate free movement of labor anyway. Uh, such are the economic differences between the wealthier member states and the poorer member states, and that's not even including the Balkans who are still to join over the next 10 years, that the kind of constraints that will be available in future enlargements will make free movement of labor very qualified. But that's going to be over a five to 10 year period. It's not going to be available to us. <coughs> <clears throat> for this current uh, negotiation. So that leaves the service sector. 
financial services and the position for banks, for investment trusts, for asset management, insurance uh, and the like. Uh, there it will depend uh, not that's not in a sense directly related to free movement of labour for everyone. When it comes to a serious negotiation, then it, there will only be something to negotiate if there's something in it for both sides, as we know in any negotiation. If the UK is a demandeur and other member states on services have no interest in the UK market, then we're not going to get very far, and why should we? Uh, we will lose the uh, involvement in the euro, we will lose headquarters, and we'll have no compensatory concessions. But uh, only last week we got some hard information that suggests it may not be quite as depressing as that. Uh, our UK Financial Conduct Authority uh, revealed the figures of the use of passporting in the European Union. And this is all about passporting, as this audience will know, about the ability to access other countries' markets uh, in the EU, uh, as a matter of, of right. At the moment, uh, we, we're told, there are some 5,500 British companies that use passporting to the rest of the EU, mostly in the sectors of it. insurance is the most important, but also asset management, uh, banking, the, the various others that you would expect. 5,500. What is interesting, and I hadn't heard the figure before, is that we now know there are over 8,000 companies in other EU countries, in continental EU countries, that use passporting to get access to the UK financial market. Now, the fact that it's 8,000 rather than 5,500 is not surprising, because these 8,000 are obviously spread between uh, a lot of countries, but most of them, I think it's safe to assume, will be German, French, Italian, Benelux, from the core of Europe. Now, these are companies that have the same financial interest, incentive, for a relationship with the UK that we would like with them after we leave. They will be putting the same representations, the same pressure to their governments, to their negotiators, saying, look, the City of London, the rest of the UK financial market is important to us. We will suffer. Commerce Bank is just one example of a large bank that uh, uses passporting. Uh, Deutsche Bank, others do as well. So if that is correct, then we have the crucial ingredient for a lot of serious negotiation. And I'm not naive. Uh, there are going to be significant losses. Companies that have set up in London as their headquarters in order to service the whole of Europe will not have any obvious reason uh, for wishing to continue unless it becomes quite soon clear uh, that passporting of some kind will continue to be available. So there will be some losses in that sector. And there will be others of a comparable kind. But I think it's unnecessary to be the doom and gloom end of the spectrum and say this is going to be disaster for the City of London. Uh, the, the fact is that the strength of the City of London did not begin with our membership of the European Union. We were able to use our membership to make it even stronger than it had been in the past. And it will be deeply sad if there is some contraction. The final point I want to make uh, before I, I, I sit down uh, is that, of course, when you look at the wider question of Britain's relationship with the European Union, it is not just a truism to say that we will be leaving the European Union but not leaving Europe. Because on all the issues that fundamentally affect and will continue to affect the United Kingdom, whether it's national security, whether it's common defense, whether it is issues discussed this morning or elsewhere. Britain, because Europe is are our nearest neighbors, will continue to have a deep, serious interest. And talk of becoming little Englanders or becoming isolationist was not even arguments used by the Brexit side during the course of the referendum campaign. And on the wider issue of our overall attitude to Europe, it is worth remembering that when during the 20th century we had two world wars. On, in 1914, Britain was involved from day one. There was no European Union involved. Britain was involved from day one when the Kaiser invaded Belgium. In 1939, Britain was involved the first day when Hitler invaded Poland. 
wasn't because of our membership of European unions or the equivalent at that time. It was because we have always judged, and the same applied with Napoleon, that the security of these islands requires us to be part of a European response when the security of Europe is threatened in a fundamental way, either by Russia or the Soviet Union or, or by any potential aggressor. Uh, and that remains as true as ever. So I conclude these comments by saying that uh, I think this is an incredibly challenging period. Uh, the saddest thing is that so many of our best uh, brains in the diplomatic service and the civil service in business are going to be emptying their entries, have emptied their entries, in order to concentrate exclusively on this issue over the next couple of years. Um, I think the end result will be satisfactory, but it's a pity we have to spend several years in order to get back to somewhere relevant to where we already are. Thank you very much indeed.